microphone levels like this, you know, as soon as the uh, recorder starts. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm hoping, you know, you guys are not having, you know, too much uh, of a problem with the tool, you know, for the homework assignment. Um, so are there any questions related to the homework assignment? Okay, nothing? All right. But do you guys see, you know, how, you know, how it connects to the topics of this class? Okay. Yes. For those of you who are in uh, computer engineering or electrical engineering, as I said, you know, um, you will see tools like that, you know, again and again. Um, but how do you think people uh, design processor these days? I'm just, you know, posing as a question, you know, because, you know, what you did or what you are doing for this homework assignment is kind of related to designing a processor, you know, because those are, you know, like gates and logic inside the processor. But for an entire processor, which is actually quite a bit more complex than, you know, just, you know, how to add two numbers, how do you think, you know, like Intel or AMD, how do they specify, you know, um, the design of a processor? What kind of tool? You know, what kind of representation? What kind of tools do you think they use? Diagrams. Diagrams? Okay. Well, the nice thing about a diagram is easy to follow, but the problem with the diagram is the, the density is really low. In other words, it takes a lot of space to specify, you know, very little things. You know, like you, know, you cannot if you want to design a processor as complicated as an i7 using diagrams, it's not going to be convenient. I mean, you will end up with a big, huge diagram. It will be really difficult to locate stuff and to make changes to it. Um, the, in industry, what they use, um, I'm just going to give you a link to it so that you can see the, what it is. Not this one. <clears throat> so in industry, what they do you know, to specify the logic of a processor or anything that is complicated is a programming language, well, in quotes, called Verilog. So if you look up the word, you know, Verilog, um, it you know tells you basically what it is. Um, it's a hardware description language, but that's not you know how it was begin, how it was uh, begun or invented. It was invented as a language to specify logic to be simulated to be verified, and hence the name Verilog. Um, but it is a hardware description language. It looks kind of like C and C++. Um, but it allows you to use a text type language to describe you know, how components or gates inside a processor, you know, how they all interconnect. So it's a really kind of interesting thing. Um, and I, th I know at Berkeley, you know, at Berkeley they have an EECS degree so they don't really differentiate between EE and CS. Um, the final year project is to use Verilog um, I think either Verilog or VHDL, but they're both you know, the same type of language, to design a simple processor, and then you use a simulator to run the processor itself. Okay, so that's you know how people you know, design processors in industry. It's way beyond the scope of this class. You know, I just want to give you guys some exposure of you know what people actually use in industry to design components. So I'm gonna get this one out of the way. Um, I'm, I'm reordering the topics a little bit again. So instead of you know, continuing to talk about memory, I'm going to skip all the way to topic two for the time being and start with addressing modes and memory allocation. Um, and then we'll go back to talk about memory and how to access memory. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because you know, I want to kind of continue to use the tool, you know, Logi Logisim, um, to design you know, like a very simple array of memory cells so that you guys can actually see how memory is addressed you know, at the hardware level. Okay? So I'm going to deferring that you know, until I get you know, the tool ready. Um, and I, have new, I will have new notes you know, written for that as well. So I'm skipping to topic two for the time being and start to look at you know, ad addressing modes and memory allocation. And that's only from the software perspective. It doesn't really show you um, inside the computer, inside the processor, how things are done. But I will go back and show you how things are done from the hardware pers perspective once I have the tools and all the notes, you know, uh, basically written. You know, it will be new notes, you know, that I'm going to write for this semester. All right. So, having said that, we're going to skip to this particular one, which is addressing modes and memory allocation. All right. <clears throat> so we are actually going into assembly language programming. You know, with this topic, 
Um, and we won't be going too far. We will only be using the move instruction. Okay. Um, is a need to go back a little bit to talk about something else. You know, reordering things has this you know, kind of disadvantage of you know sometimes you know, things will become kind of disjoint because you know I have not talked about registers versus memory yet. Okay, so I'll give you a quick uh, summary of what is memory and what is register and why they are different um, before we move on to talk about the instructions because you do need to understand the basic ideas of what is a register as opposed to what is memory. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, memory access. Memory access is very slow. And I know you have, you know, we have really fast computers these days and it has really high speed memory. But the high speed, the so-called high speed memory is still relatively slow compared to the processing speed. In other words, if every single time you execute an instruction, it has to go to the main memory of your computer, you know, 8 gig, 16 gig, 32 gig of memory, to get a few bytes, to process those few bytes, and it has to store those few bytes back into memory. If it has to do that for every single instruction that it executes, your computer will become extremely slow. Okay, your 2.4 you know, gigahertz, you know, 3 gigahertz you know, processor really doesn't matter because most of the time it's waiting for memory to be ready. It's waiting for all of that stuff to be done. I'm not going to get into the details of why memory access is so, so slow you know, because we will get into that later on with a logic sim. So I will have, I will basically design you know, a small uh, simulator so that you can, sh you can see you know, step by step you know, why accessing memory is so slow. But it is slow, okay? So why would you even bother to have a three gigahertz you know, processor when you can only utilize you know, up to maybe 500 megahertz you know, to execute instructions when you know, accessing, memory, accessing memory becomes the bottleneck? Well, how do you alle alleviate that problem? Okay, I'll give you one analogy, okay? So let's just say that you know I am reading you know a book in this class. Let's say this is a history class and it is textbook heavy. All right? Can everybody kind of imagine that scenario? Yes. Okay. And I have no idea what I'm teaching because it's history. Okay. So I have to use my textbook and basically just read out of my textbook, you know, page by page. Okay. And I had professors in the past that actually taught classes like that. At the beginning of the class, you know, there's a big, thick, you know, textbook, and he will plop it on the podium, and then the instructor, the professor, will just read the textbook page by page, without looking at the students. So his face, his eyes would be like this, you know, facing down completely, and just read the text, you know, page by page. I could have done that myself, <laughs> on my own. Okay, but anyway, okay, but this gets worse. Okay. Because instead of having the entire textbook with me, I can only have, let's say, two pages of uh, text on the podium at any particular time. All right? So we have a pretty bad scenario here. Um, and every time I have to flip to the next page, I will have to ask one of you to go to the library, to go to the sh a certain shelf, get a certain textbook, flip to a certain page, go to the copier, Make a photocopy of that and run back to the to this classroom so I can continue to read from that page that you come back, that you come back with. That is an analogy of how slow memory is. I'm the processor, okay? I can read a page at a time, but in order to flip to the next page to get your know, extra stuff, I need someone to go to the library all the way to the library, go to the textbook, make a photocopy, and then come back with the photocopy. It is that slow by comparison. Are we doing okay so far with this analogy? Okay. So it helps to be able to keep certain things you know, like local to me. So I don't have to ask some of you, one of you to go back to the library all the time. And that's registers. Okay. So registers are basically local storage that I have immediate access to. Okay. And I can and um, what registers are? is they are special memory, well, I shouldn't say memory, but they're, st they're special storage local to the processor that can keep up with the processing speed of the processor itself. Okay, let's take a look at another analogy. 
So let's say that I am, I'm a processor, I have a calculator. I have a very simple calculator, and I can perform calculations really, really fast. But in order to get the data for me to process, you guys will have to go to the library all the time and just come back and say, oh, okay, here's a number for you to add to the average, okay, to add to the data point, okay? So most of the time, I'm not using the calculator at all. Most of the time, you guys are running to the library. And guess what? If I don't have registers, that means the running sum, the number of items or number of samples, is also stored somewhere in the library instead of in this classroom which is really, really cumbersome if you think about it. Is that making any sense? How many people have taken statistics and know what is a sum, average, um, the mean of samples and stuff like that? Okay, so that means you know, the sum is stored somewhere in the library, the number of samples is stored somewhere in the library, so when, and obviously the data points are stored in the library as well. I don't have anything to store here, okay? I just compute numbers. I can maybe you know, process like one number and then two numbers. I can do a division, I can perform an addition, but once I, I'm done with the addition or the division, the result has to be stored back in the library. I have no local storage. That is life with only computer memory. And as your processor, okay, as the i7 processor, it may be very fast, it might have eight cores, okay? But without, you know, a, without a mechanism where you can store information locally, it would be memory bound. In other words, you know, it will be, all the time will be wasted just by going to the memory, trying to get something back, do a little bit of processing, and then waste all the time to go out and store something back into memory before the next instruction can execute. Is that okay so far? You know, memory is slow, and you know, we cannot just rely on com computer memory. So what I really want to do is to have a kind of little, a, a little notepad with me, okay? Maybe just you know, a few post-its, okay? So when I'm trying to compute the average of a you know, collection of samples, what I'll do is I'm gonna keep the running sum, the number of items, um, and maybe a few other things just locally here, okay? So this way, you, know, you, still, you will still have to go to the library to get me the raw data to process but at least you won't be having to go to going back and forth to get me the sum, the number of samples, and all the other you know, stuff that I need you know, for each particular you know, calculation. This is my register, okay? Now, how, does, how do you think you know, the number of pages on this little notepad here compared to the total number of pages of material stored in the library? This is not a whole lot, right? The library has you know, probably millions, if not billions, of pages of uh, printed material. Um, so that's o but that's okay, because I don't really need to access all those billions of pages all at the same time. I only need to access a few pages at a time. Is that analogy working? You know, why registers is useful, okay? Now registers are not memory, okay? They are two distinct things. Um, each register, okay, I, I guess, I suppose I can just you know, use this as a prop here. Okay. So each register has a name. I'm looking for a dry board marker. Permanent will work as well. Okay, so registers are named also. So in the Intel processor, we have, you know, registers, one is called EAX. So what I do is, you know, in the classroom, in, inside the processor, I have one register called EAX, and I think there's a way to attach it up here. No. Okay, I guess I need a thumbtack for that. But you can just kind of imagine that I have a few pa pieces of paper. This will work. So just put it up here where you can see it. I have one called EAX, and then another one called EBX. I will explain the name, you know, but they're just really just the name of these registers. They are not numbers, okay? Registers are not identified by numbers from your perspective as a programmer. It is identified by a name. So I have, you know, these registers here, there's, I'm not gonna spell out every single one, so I'll just give you an example of two of these. I have register EAX, register EBX, register ECX, e, ECX, EDX, 
ESP, EBP, and so on. Um, you know, don't try to memorize all the registers that we'll be using because you will encounter those registers later on. Um, each one can only store a number. Okay, it can, it's a 32-bit number they can store. Not really a whole lot of information, but if I just want to keep track of the running sum of you know, calculating the average of something or the number of items that I have encountered or number of samples, these are great for that purpose. Are we still doing okay so far with that concept? Okay. Um, so these are registers. When we talk about main memory, it is like a huge array of bytes in C++ and in C. Well, in Java as well. Okay. The main memory of your computer, let's say you have 16 gigs of memory. The 16 gigs of memory can be seen as one single huge array of bytes. Okay. And each time you do an index, indexing, you can access one byte at a time. Or you can access four bytes at a time, eight bytes at a time, and so on. But nonetheless, you look at the entire memory of your computer as one huge array. These are not a part of that array. Okay? Look at these as individual, uh, individual variables in a program. They are not a part of the main memory. Are we still doing okay so far with those concepts? So where's yep. the actual memory on the board? The actual memory is on its own little circuit board. Um, they're called DIMMs, D-I-M-Ms, um, dual inline memory modules. So when you look at the circuit board of a modern computer, okay, this is just a schematic, okay, it's not the actual physical layout, you usually have a processor and um, inside the register, inside the processor are the registers. So registers are inside not just the processor, but each core has its own sets of registers. If you have a four core processor, then you will have four individual, four, four independent sets of registers. So registers stay very close to the main processing unit, which we call the ALU, and that's why it can keep up with the processing speed, because physically it is just right next door. On the other hand, your main memory are, you know, they're basically extra chips or extra circuit boards that you have to plug into the motherboard, um, at least with desktop computers. Um, so they are outside of the processor, and you have to run, you know, traces on the circuit board to connect the processor to the memory. And that's why it is so slow, okay? It has to do with the length of the trace from the processor, from a pin of the processor to one of the pins of your DIMM. And that length of conductor is a very big limitation of how fast you can transmit data. How many people have taken electromagnetics in physics? Okay, we have one, okay? So what do you think, you know, which physical quantity or which two physical quantities is the problem of you know conducting electricity or having a pulse trans trying to transmit a pulse on a conductor? Um, trying to transmit electricity. Yeah. So if I want to transmit, let's say, a square wave, you know, on the conductor, mm -hmm. this is the ideal waveform. Um, if you have a long conductor, what happens to this waveform? Uh, you get resistance in the line. There's resistance on the line, but there are two more types of uh, quantities that are really bad for transmitting square waves. Uh, electromagnetic waves generated by the other wires close by. Interference, okay. But interference is because of inductance, and there's also capacitance on the line. Mm -hmm. In other words, every time you have a wire you know, on, or a trace on the circuit board, you are talking about inductance and also capacitance. Those, are, those two quantities are inevitable. Okay, they may be very small for the purposes of like you know turning on a light. Okay, it's insignificant. But when you're trying to transmit you know a pulse like this, and the time is very short, oh, then becomes significant. Okay, so inductance and capacitance. You know, we're not. I'm not going to explain the math behind that. You know, in this class. But what I'll do is I'll show you the actual waveform. You know, when you're trying to transmit something that's really high speed. Yeah, there's still a little color, but that's okay. I'm gonna use you know, the, this one here. This is what we want, but in reality, it becomes like this. Because of capacitance and inductance, okay? 
So you can see that you know, the shorter you try to shrink the, the timing of the waveform, the worse it gets. So at some point, it doesn't look like you know, a square wave anymore, which also means that at some point, your, your processor cannot communicate with your memory modules effectively anymore. You start to have you know, random you know, bits of you know, corruption and stuff like that. We kind of do okay so far with those concepts. And that's why it is so slow. It has to do with how quickly can we physically you know, change a signal here and have the memory modules to register that signal reliably and vice versa. And it cannot go very fast. But we have DDR technology. I mean, that certainly makes things go faster, right? What is DDR? I mean, I know you guys you know, know about your computers, especially when you buy a new computer, you have to look up the specs. So you have to find out, OK, what is the uh, technology behind the memory the modules and stuff like that. What is the current top of the line you know, DDR technology? DDR4, OK? So we started off with just regular DDR, which stands for? Double data rate. Double data rate, exactly. So with DDR4, it's not just double anymore, right? It means more like quadruple or more than that. It only helps in some cases, OK? Does anyone know how DDR works? OK, so the way DDR works is it's like this. Okay, so remember the, uh, the example of a textbook that I'm reading in the class, and you guys have to go, back, go to the library all the time to fetch the next page, okay? So without DDR, every time I ask you to, to, go, to go to the library, I would have to spend the time to write down the call number, you know, and then the page number that I want you to make a copy of, okay? In other words, I have to give, give you the full specification of which page I want you to bring back to me. Okay, which takes time because you know it takes time for me to write down you know QA ninety eight point something you know and then give you the entire code for the call number and then give you the page number and then when you go to the library every single time you have to go to the shelf find the right book find the right page and then make a copy and every time you make a copy guess what it's only one for one page and then you put the and then you put the book back onto the shelf and then come back here with the photocopy of, of only one page of it. It is inefficient. So one way we can make it more efficient is like this. I tell you, um, guess what? I need 16 pages. Give me, bring back 16 pages, starting at, on this page of this book. So you go to the library, you find a book, you flip to the first page that I want you to make a photocopy of, and then guess what? You go to the photocopier, and then you make pages. You make photocopies of 16 pages instead of one. So you're saving time because you're no longer you know, go, coming back to me, and then I give you the full specification of the next page. You go to the library, make a photocopy of the next page, you come back, and so on. So instead of making 16 trips to the library, and then go to the book in the library 16 times and flipping to the right page 16 times, you only have to go do that once. And then you just say, you just stay at a photocopier, okay? Make 16 photocopies, and then you come back to me with 16 pages. So this is kind of like the analogy of how DDR works, okay? You specify the beginning, and then you specify, I want it to be transmitting in quote unquote burst mode, which means, you know, give me the consecutive pages without having to re-specify which pages I want to use. And we're doing okay so far with you know, just the, the basic idea of DDR. Well, it helps only if I am reading the textbook sequentially, right? Because if I'm jumping all over the place in a textbook, you can bring me back the next 16 pages, but none of those other 15 pages are what I'm going to read. So I'm going to have to have send you to back to the library to get another page of some other parts of the same textbook, which doesn't help. So DDR is a wonderful technology. It helps with certain types of programming and, you know, and certain types of programs to run, but it doesn't help in all cases. And there's also a trade-off between DDR, you know, the later DDRs and the earlier DDRs. And I think it has to do with you know, the setup time versus the actual burst mode you know, transmission time. 
the later technology will take a little bit more time to set up, but once it's set up, the actual burst mode trans transmission or transfer is faster. As opposed to the earlier DDR technology, the setup time is not that bad, but you know, the actual um, transmission data rate is not as good as the later ones. So you have a trade-off between the setup time versus the actual transfer time. Okay, so, but the most important part here is to establish that we have such a thing called memory, and registers are not a part of memory. That is the one thing that I want to make clear at this point. Is that okay so far? Okay. So if that part is okay, we're going to move on and kind of actually go into the programming part of assembly language. I'm just trying to find the right window. I think I might have closed it. Just go ahead. Open it again. All right. So the first instruction that we're going to deal with is called the move instruction. Yes, it is missing an E. You know, if I, I have no idea why it is missing an E. Uh, certain instructions is spelled out entirely, and most other instructions are missing a character. Like jump is JMP, move is MOV, and so on. Okay, so the move instruction um, basically it will allows you to specify a source and a destination. And this is the way you read you know, this type of syntax here. When you read syntax, it's usually, there are usually ways to describe you know, syntax, and this is one way to describe the syntax of something. If you see something that is not within anything, like quotes or brackets or angle brackets and stuff like that, it means it, is, it has to be written verbatim. In other words, MOV is the beginning part of the instruction. You must have MOV in the instruction. When you see square brackets, like this one here, it means whatever it is enclosing is optional. Okay, so optional stuff is usually in square bracket when people describe syntax. And inside here, we can see that you know you can have you B it has B vertical bar W vertical bar L. The vertical bar is used to um, separate alternatives. So in this case, uh, you can choose one of the three B, W, or L, all lowercase as an optional component right after MOV. So the instruction can be MOV all by itself, can be MOVB, MOVW, and MOVL. Is that okay so far? You know, how to read the syntax description? This is a fairly standard way to describe syntax you know, for, most, for a lot of languages. So learning how to you know, read it is going to be helpful. But what about the square, I mean, the angle, bra angle brackets, like this one here? The angle brackets in this context simply means that your know, SRC, which is the source, um, is a placeholder. Okay, you don't just type SRC, you know, with angle brackets, you know, in your actual program. You have to replace it with something else that specifies the source of the operand or where you're copying from. So whatever is enclosed by square um, angle brackets, you have to replace the entire thing with something else. It's just a placeholder in this case. Same thing with destination. In this case, it is just a placeholder. You will have to replace it with something that does not even spell like DEST or have you know, angle brackets in it. Are there any questions about how to read this? I'll give you some examples. So later on, you will definitely come to see you know, how the syntax is, uh, describes the actual uh, language. So this is just you know, repeating what I said a little bit earlier, okay? So there's nothing new here. The last part is kind of important. MOV, which it stands for move, is called a mnemonic. Um, a mnemonic <coughs> in assembly language programming is just basically a, a word that is either derived from you know, some English words or an abbreviation of some kind that is more meaningful to a programmer than just a whole bunch of zeros and ones that describes the opcode of the instruction. So in this case, you know, MOV is much better than the actual opcode or opcodes in this case because it tells you that we are moving um, data from one place, which is the source, to another place, which is the destination. But it's a misnomer. It's a misnomer because there's no such thing as copy is moving 
It's more like a copy. Okay? So at this point, you know, if you're thinking about, but what do you talk about moving versus copying? Let me just you know, give you an example in C, C++, or Java, or most programming languages has this feature. So let's say I have two integers, okay, x and y. Um, x first you know, gets a value of 26, and then we have the next instruction, y gets x. Okay, and we'll focus on the second instruction, or the second statement. The second statement is kind of like doing the move instruction thing, we are moving from x to y. But moving implies that wherever you're moving from will not have that thing anymore, right? So the question now is, after the second statement, y gets x, does the value of x changes from 46 to nothing, or does x stop to exist because we have just, quote unquote, moved the data or the value from x to y? The value stays, exactly. We are not actually moving something, right? In the physical world, we actually can move something, okay? I have my marker you know, originally here, and I can move it, right? So if I move my marker from one place to the next place, then it disappears from the original place. It makes perfect sense with real objects. But when you're talking about data or values in variables and memory locations, it doesn't make sense. Because you know the the source, whatever is originating the, the 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 value, is still still there. So x is still there after the second statement. It still has the same value, which is forty six. It's just that we also copy the value of forty six into y. Am I making any sense? Okay. So with these instructions, it's the same way. The move instruction really should have been called copy. Because all we are doing is copying the data value from the source to the destination. We are not making the source disappear in any way with this instruction. So I just want to point this out you know, so that we are clear about the move instruction does not actually destroy the source of the copy. This section talks about the operands. There are, each operand is kind of like a parameter to a subroutine. Okay? So if you remember in your C and C++ class or in Java, you encountered multiple, you know, many different types of you know, functions. Name one function that has at least two parameters. What was that, sorry? Okay, name one C++, C or C++ function that takes at least two parameters. String copy. String copy, very good. Okay, string copy takes two parameters, okay? Because if you just call string copy with no parameters, what is it going to do? <laughs> Nothing, right? It cannot do a single thing because you have to give it the source, where am I copying from, and the destination, where I'm copying to. And by the way, don't use string copy in real programs. <laughs> As your C++ professor ever told you, do not use string copy in actual real programs. No? <laughs> well, that is why we have problems with security in terms of program. Okay, so I'm going to digress a little bit here and talk about why you should not. Eventually, this will connect with what we talk about in this class, okay? String copy versus string and copy. And eventually, that is going to relate to the topics of this class. Okay, so I'm going to digress a little bit and talk about string copy versus string and copy. All right, string copy versus string and copy. Okay, string copy, as the name implies, is copying one string you know, to another string, or you're copying content from one character array to another character array. Okay, that's pretty easy. And string and copy is doing the same thing, but it is also length or and uh, the, the length uh, delimited. Delimited, yeah, delimited. So. With string copy, you're just basically saying, okay, if the source string has you know, 2,000 characters before it encounters the null terminator, copy all 2,000 characters plus the null terminator to the destination. But what if your destination is, uh, is a buffer that only has 16 bytes reserved? Copy all 2,001 bytes anyway. 
Okay, that's a straight copy. Whatever, whatever the length of the source is, that is how many bytes it will try to copy to the destination, even if the destination does not have that many bytes already reserved. String and copy is saying, well, try to copy as many characters as you can, but stop when one of these two conditions is met. One is the null terminator is encountered. Okay, if the null terminator is encountered, stop copying because that's the end of the string. Two is when you run out of space. So it has a third parameter to specify up to how many bytes should I copy. Now why does that even matter? I mean, it's like... You can access memory that uh, is exclusively set aside for something else when you shouldn't be able to access that. Exactly, okay? Such as, you know, a lot of uh, file formats, okay? You know, like, if you like, take a look at JPEGs or GIFs, um, they have, you know, sections of the file, you know, like this section, you can use any type of description, okay, like to describe the image. And this section here, you can describe the copyright notice and whatnot, okay? I have no idea what format it is following. But there's usually a length limit, like, okay, this portion can only be up to, you know, 32 characters, 64 characters, you know, 128 characters, whatever, okay, has a limit to it. But what if someone doctors a file so that, you know, that description is longer than what is allowed? If your program is only relying on the terminator and say, I will keep reading and stuffing stuff into memory until I encounter the uh, end of string character, usually it's the no terminator, then your program can be overwriting stuff that is not supposed to. Okay? I'll give you one example. Okay. I'll just say, you know, here's my uh, subroutine called clone. Clone is going to do this. Um, it has a source string and a destination string. And, oops, that's probably not a good thing to do. It specifies a source and let's say it has, this is not clone, it is process, okay? It's going to process a string that is passed to it. But in order to do some processing, it will have to do some in-place changes and whatnot. And since you are not supposed to change what source is pointing at, because it's a const, um, we'll have a we'll have a local array, and then we'll do the pro local pro we'll do the processing with the local array. Okay. So we'll have a local array. We'll just call it your know, buffer. And because you have just read the specification of whatever you're processing, you know, you know in theory it can only have up to this many characters, okay? So we'll just say that according to the specification of the standard, uh, whatever you're processing cannot exceed 64 characters. So as a result, you say, well, I'll just go ahead and declare a local array of 64 characters. Before you do any type of processing, you do a string copy, okay? So CPR, string copy, and I think you specify the destination first, so you specify buffer first, and then you specify the source, which is, you know, a parameter passed to you, okay? All right, and then, you know, after this, you can do, you know, processing, you know, so you can say, oh, you know, and, oh, <coughs> better yet, something like that. Then you can <coughs> say, you know, PTR goes, I guess, to the beginning of buffer, you know, PTR plus plus, And oops, no, no, no. You have you keep processing until you encounter the end of the buffer. So you will say as long as PTR is not null, whatever PTR points it is not null, you'll keep moving to the next one. And then inside the loop, you do some processing. Process whatever PTR points to. And that might involve you know overwriting those con that content and whatnot. There's a problem with this code. What if the source string is actually longer than 64 bytes? Never get a null terminator. Or never get a null terminator. Okay. So that means that the string copy is not going to stop when it runs out of space in buffer. It will keep going. But buffer only has 64 bytes. If you overwrite more than 64 bytes, then you end up with the same problem as the program that I showed you at the very beginning of this class, of this semester. Remember, bad return? 
you will be overwriting stuff that your program is not supposed to overwrite, and really bad things can happen, you know, when with programs like that. So that's why we should not use a string copy because string copy does not check, you know, how many bytes you are actually copying. It will just copy the entire thing. String and copy, on the on the other hand, allows you to specify a length and say, do not copy any more than this many bytes, and then you have some protection. So. I'm going to pass the row sheet at this point. That's a good one. Yeah. So now the question is, if I have code that looks like this, um, what do you think people can do with this kind of program? Well, that's easy. They can crash, right? You know, if you specify something, you know, um, a file that does not conform to the standard, it's going to overwrite something. It's going to crash. Well, that's that's the best thing that can happen. Okay, it's, it just crashes. But what if someone you know, doctored the exact stuff after this, these 64 bytes so that it messes up the stack, you know, we'll talk about those in this class, and when it returns, it returns to what we call a payload part of the program that will you know, try to open up a shell you know, and basically open your computer for further attacks. It's an exploit, okay? An exploit exists only because you know a lot of programmers make use of functions like these that are not protected. They do not check against the length of the actual buffer. This is called a stack overflow exploit. We'll talk about this again in this class, okay? But I just want to give you some exposure to you know why you should not use a string copy. Um, always use string and copy instead. Really curious. Does that happen with Java as well? Use string copy. Um, it, it interestingly, it does not apply to Java. Just some um, it does not apply to Java because I keep losing my uh, other window. It does not apply to Java because in Java, um, array indexing has checking built into oh, it. That's right. So if you try to access an array out of bound, you know, yeah, it, it creates a runtime error right away. The same thing with uh, Visual Basic. If you try to access an array out of bound, you know, it gives you a runtime error. So uh, that's why, with, sorry? I've done that plenty of times. Yep, <laughs> and, and it's a good thing, because if you do not have a runtime error you know, that actually complains and say what went wrong you know, exactly, then you end up corrupting, corrupting memory. And depending on what you're corrupting, there may be no symptoms until much later in your program. So it will crash a part of your program that has absolutely nothing to do with the reason why your program is crashing. So you'll be looking at the wrong place of your program thinking, oh, something is wrong with this code when there's absolutely nothing wrong with that code. <coughs> and whatever went wrong happened long ago. <laughs> yep. And C, C++ programming you know, you know, is susceptible to this type of problem. All right, so we're done with this slide here. <coughs> Moving on, there are three types of operands, okay? And each operand is like a parameter to an opcode to an instruction. Because you have to specify the source and you have to specify the destination. The immediate operand is pretty easy to understand. All it says is whatever I specify is the value of whatever I want to you know, copy in this case. And the immediate operand is preceding with a dollar sign to indicate it is an immediate operand. Um, I can't really just talk about the immediate operand and give you an example because it only specifies something that only can be specified as the source operand. So I have to give you something that can also be specified as the destination operand. And the easiest one would be the registers. So a register operand is one that refers to the value of a register or the content of a register. Um, most processors has only a small number of registers, maybe 16, you know, maybe up to 32 or so, but that's it, okay? It's not like in megabytes of memory even. There are several reasons why there are very few registers. First of all, a modern processor uses general purpose registers, which means all registers must be, can be, act, can be used as a source or the destination operand of an instruction. So this is also a good time to give you a general idea of you know, what, it's, what it looks like inside a processor. 
Inside the processor, we have something called an ALU. And typically, an ALU looks like a little Y, you know, really thick, fat, you know, Y symbol, because you have input, usually two, and output here. This is my dumb calculator. It has no storage in it, okay? It's called an ALU, which stands for Arithmetic Logic Unit. Okay, it performs all the calculations. Addition, subtraction, increment, decrement, to a certain extent, you know, division and multiplication and so on. So you give the information to process, it'll give you the answer. But it doesn't know how to store anything. It has no storage whatsoever built into it. So next to the ALU are our registers. So you have all of these registers, let's say eight of these, and all eight registers, you can specify each, any one of these eight as the first source. You can specify any one of these eight as the second. And when the computation is done, it can also store into one of these eight registers. Now, it sounds really simple you know, when we just say, oh, you can you know, grab this operand from any one of these eight registers. You can grab this operand from any one of these eight registers. And when the computation is done, you can store the result back into one of these eight registers. But in terms of implementation, it's a nightmare. The reason why it's a nightmare in terms of implementation is now the pathways between the registers and the ALU is now a full matrix. In other words, you know, you have to create every single bit of this register here has to find a path from here to here, and a path from here to here, and a path from here back to here. And you can kind of imagine, you know, if each register is 32-bit and you have eight of these, you have a lot of pathways to kind of, you know, route through the processor. And for the most part, a processor is still a two-dimensional kind of thing. In other words, you have a waiver which is you know, just kind of a very thin you know, sheet of silicon. And then you can print circuits on it. So you have to route all of these signals on, on a two-dimensional device. Um, it's not easy. And that's why you cannot have too many registers. Because you can kind of imagine, if you have a lot more of these registers, the logic, the connection between the registers and the ALU gets even more complicated. And, and, you, and what you, uh, they say that you run out of routing resources. In other words, there's no way to route a signal from one point to another point anymore. You just run out of, run out of resources. Uh, is, that, is that part okay? You know, why we cannot have too many registers? Even though having more registers would be beneficial to programming, we cannot have too many because of that limitation. So that's, you know, this is basically the, the whole point is, you know, the switch between, you know, the registers and the ALU is expensive, okay? We can only implement the switch up to a certain size. Um, a register can also must keep up with the speed of the ALU, and that's the whole point of having registers is so that we don't have to access main memory and we can keep certain data local to the processor so we don't have to go out all the time. In order for registers to keep, up with the, keep up, to keep up with this speed, they must be physically close to the ALU, but only so many registers can be close to the ALU, because if you have too many, then some of those registers are no longer physically close to the ALU, and therefore they have problems with speed ac access speed again. A register operand can be a source operand. It can also be a destination operand. In other words, you can use a register to specify what to process, but you can also store the result of processing into a register. In this case, the, with the move instruction, you can copy something into a register. You can also copy something from a register to another register. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at some sample programs so that you can see what the instructions look like and how do you kind of visualize these instructions in this class. <coughs> What I'll do is I'm going to use a you know just a text terminal here, and I'll just go ahead and make a folder for the move instruction you know as examples. Um, I use Vim you know to create my programs, but you can use any editor that you feel comfortable with. Um, inside the Linux environment, Nano and Vim are usually installed, but there are additional ones that you can also install. But you know since I only use Vim, I'm not really familiar with the options. 
So we'll go ahead and you know create one example. Example one, um, when you create a source file, you always end up with a .s lowercase as the extension. Okay. Later on in this semester, we'll use uppercase s as an extension, but for now, we only use lowercase. And when you write a program, there are several things that you have to observe. Uh, the first part is it is conventional that you have to start with dot .text. Um, I'll explain that later, you know, because you, know, you, can, you can switch between the uh, code segment versus the data segment. But for now, we will just say that, okay, we start with dot .text. The second thing is you have to say underscore uh, dot global underscore start um, because we have to tell the linker where is the entry point of this entire program. Underscore start as a label marks the beginning of the entire program. And then you can actually start with the program. Okay? Start underscore start colon defines a label. All it does is to say, oh, there's another name of this location. It's called underscore start. Okay? It's just a bookmark with a symbolic name so that you can refer to the name easily. And now we can start to write our program. So what we'll do is we'll have one instruction, move L, dollar uh, one into a register called EAX. <coughs> so if I want to comment this, I will say the source is uh, immediate operand and the value is one. The destination is a register and the name of the register is EAX. So right here you can see when you want to use an immediate operand, you have to precede the value of the operand with a dollar sign. In this case, the value of the operand is just one as a value. And then the dollar sign is just saying, okay, this is an immediate operand. Um, so whatever the value is after the dollar sign, that is the value being copied to the destination. Question? Um, move L to develop the space between move L or this is the operator? There's a, uh, between move L, okay, move L is one word. So there's no space between MOV and the L. Move L stands for move long, um, which is moving 32 bit at a time. In this case, the L is can be implied because the use of register EAX implies it is a long operand already. But it is always nice to specify the width of the operation all the time. Um, and then I'll have a second instruction to illustrate how do we how we can copy from one register to another register. So this time I can specify register EAX as the source, and then we can specify EBX as the destination. So in this case, the source is a register, register EAX, and then the destination is register EBX. We are not using memory at all in this case. Okay. And the, the pound sign or the, the hash sign, this one, is um, it starts comments on the line. It's the same thing as slash slash in Java or C++. Okay. Is everybody okay with uh, you know start how to start comments on the line? So it runs all the way to the end of the line, um, but the next line is not comment anymore. Just like you know with the slash slash, you know it simply says from here on to the end of the line is comment. All right. So to stop a program, to terminate a program, we don't really have to understand this part for the time being. But you will see that all programs that we write, or at least most of the programs that we write, end with these three instructions. I'm not going to explain these three just yet, you know, because it's out of the scope of what we want to deal with. But I'll just focus on these two instructions here. Let's copy something other than just one, because one is a very fairly common value. Let's pick something that is not as common. Let's pick, you know, this number, which is not common. It cannot be there accidentally. <coughs> okay. So I just saved the file, get out of the editor, and the first step is to assemble this particular program. To assemble the program simply means that we are creating an object code file out of this file, out of the source. And then after we have the object code, which is ex1.o, we have to do, use the linker uh, to link the program. 
So with the linker, we specify the output of the linker, which is the executable. We'll just call it ex1. And then we specify the input file or files of, the, of this particular program. This program only has one you know, object file, so ex one is the only input. But there may be other programs later on in this semester that will have multiple input object files. But for the time being, we only have one. And now we have an executable called ex1. So if you may do an ls, you know, we can see that ex1 is the executable, and we can run it. So we'll go ahead and run the program you know, using dot slash ex1. The reason why we have to specify dot slash is because the current folder or the current working directory is not a part of the path. And the path is an, what we call an environment variable that tells the operating system, where am I supposed to go find executable stuff? Okay? But because the current folder is not you know, a part of the path, when you want to run the program in the current working directory, which is what the dot is representing, you have to explicitly say, oh, find that program here in the current working directory. So that's why we have to specify the dot. And then the slash is only here, there to, to separate the folder specification, which is the dot, from the file specification, which is ex1. I just ran the program. Nothing happens. Well, that's because the program has no input and no output. Okay, So when you just run the program, there's nothing you can observe. So what we will do is we'll use GDB to take a look at the inside. As we run the program, we can look at the register content and stuff like that. So you say GDB EX1, which basically means I want to run this program, but only through the debugger GDB. So when you run GDB, it gives you a startup message like that, and then it gives you a prompt. Okay. So when you look at the bottom of this screen here, it has you know, in parentheses GDB, which means we are no longer in bash. Okay, we are no longer in the uh, command line interface. We are now inside the debugger itself. Inside the debugger, it has its own help. You can see, actually, you know, the instruction here. For help, type help. Great. That's really helpful. And when you type help, it tells you how to use help. <laughs> because there are so many different topics you can get help from, so it is classified into different types of categories, like breakpoints is a category, um, internals is a category, running is a category, and so on. You don't have to go through these helps you know, to find out what you, know, you need, because I will demonstrate you know, the, all the commands that you probably will need in order to debug your programs. Okay. <clears throat> it's really helpful to be able to list your program so you can find out, okay, where am I in the program at this point? You can say list, or you can just abbreviate that to L. So either one will work. If you type L and then press the Enter key, all it does is to print out the program up to 10 lines at a time. So it doesn't really print out the entire program. It only prints out 10 lines at a time. But this program is really short. It's less than 10 lines, so it just prints out the entire thing. So at this point, we know that the program is starting on line four. And then we can say, oh, I want this program to stop, to pause, when it gets to line four. So this way, I can take a look at the content of register EAX and EBX before it executes the instruction on line four. To put a breakpoint, you can say break. But you can also just say B. Okay? B is the abbreviation of setting a breakpoint. And then you tell it which line you want to put a breakpoint on. So in this case, I want to stop on line four, you know, right before we execute the first move L instruction. So the instruction, so the command to GDB is just B4 to put a breakpoint on line four. Okay. And it confirms that we now have one breakpoint one in file ex1.s line four. And now we are ready to run the program. In order to start running the program, you can either type run RUN or you can abbreviate it to R. And that will try to run the program at full speed. But we can't because we have a breakpoint on line four. So the breakpoint one underscore star da 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 is basically just telling you that we have encountered breakpoint one and the program has now paused its execution. It's not stopped because the word stop implies it cannot be restarted. But this one has paused, which means it can resume the execution later on. Do we have any questions about you know, using the debugger up to this point?
Yep. So the breakpoint stops it before it executes the line you did. That is correct. Yeah. Right. When you talk about the breakpoint, it is always prior to executing anything on that line. Okay. And that applies to C++ programming as well. So if you're using the same tool on C++, it's the same thing. If you put a breakpoint on the line, it stops on that line, it's, it means it, it has not executed anything on that line. So now we want to take a look at the value of EAX and maybe EBX. Uh, there are several ways to do this. Um, starting this semester, I'm going to make it very consistent. So the way we do it is to print $EAX. Um, this is a command. Print is a command inside the debugger, inside GDB. And you can specify what you want to print. You can print something that's really simple. In other words, if you just want to print a value like 45, you just say print 45. Okay. and it prints the value of 45. Not very exciting. You can also ask it to print um, what we call special internal registers. Uh, EAX is recognized by the debugger as something that's special. So when you want to print the content of the register EAX, you say print dollar $EAX. The dollar sign does not mean immediate in this case. Inside the context of GDB, the, do, the meaning of a dollar sign is different because it's just saying, okay, this is an internal variable as opposed to a variable in your program. But it does refer to register EAX and it says EAX has a value of zero at this point. Well, that's okay because you know we have not executed the code on line four and EAX is uninitialized at this point. It can have a value of zero. That's not a problem. Is that making any sense so far? Sort of? Okay. Now, in the future, there might be a need to do some calculations based on the value of a register, and you can do that too. So you can basically say, oh, what is EAX plus 10? It's 10 because EAX itself is 0. Okay. So now we want to execute the first instruction, and to single step an in instruction, you can either type step, or you can abbreviate it to just the initial character. Okay, so when you type S, it just single steps one single instruction. So when you single step, it will confirm that, okay, we have done something, but now we have stopped again on line five, just about to execute the second move L instruction. Is that okay? All right. But this is a good time to re-examine the value of EAX because it should have changed by now. Because we have just executed the instruction on line four to copy from the left hand side to the right hand side. So what do you think uh, EAX should have at this point? 1782. Yep, 1782, 1782. So let's go ahead and double check. So you can say print EAX, and it certainly has a value of um, 1782. Um, but you can, you can also do all sorts of stuff. GDB understands uh, C syntax as well. So you can basically say, you know, is the value of register EAX the same as 1782? And it will come back with a non-zero, meaning yes, it has that value. So print is fairly flexible. You know, you can utilize not only just the value of a register, but you can put it inside any expression, any C++, C++ expression, and make use of that. It's, it comes in handy, you know, at times. All right. So we are now about to execute line five, but before we execute line five, which is this instruction here, I want to ch double check on EBX first, okay? Because I want to see what is the initial value of EBX before the instruction. So I will do the same thing, print EBX. It has a value of zero, okay? Which is not 1782. I single step again. So that means I have just executed this instruction, the one that I have highlighted. So if when I print print dollar EBX, now EBX also has a value of 1782. In other words, I have just you know kind of confirmed this program does what it is supposed to, and this program also shows you. Let me go get out of the uh, uh, debugger first. To get out of the debugger, there are several ways to do it. Um, you can either use quit, you know, which can also be abbreviated to just letter, the letter Q. Or you can press Control D, you know, when you're in GDB. Both ways will confirm. You know, it's it's asking you to confirm because I have not really 
uh, completed this program yet. So this program is still being executed. You know, I'm halfway through executing this program. So the debugger just wants to be safe and say, are you really sure? Because you know, this debug session is not done yet. Um, but for this program, the rest of the program is not really that interesting. So I'm going to answer yes, yes, quit anyway. And now I'm back to the system prompt. And we can now execute further instructions in Linux. <coughs> Let's go back and take a look at this program again. EX1. Um, so several things you have to kind of remember is the dollar sign is important, okay? Because without a dollar sign, it becomes a different type of operand. Um, the percent symbol is a prefix of a register. So if you want to refer to register EAX, you have to remember to use the dollars, I mean the percent symbol. Um, so here comes the question, what if I forget? Well, I cannot possibly forget, so let's not talk about it, right? Well, if you have time, you can look at the program like this and say, I'm going to make some error in this particular program and see what happens. Okay? It's much better to do it this way than actually waiting for something like that to quote unquote naturally happen. The reason is if you inject a problem into a program that otherwise is okay, you know whatever message you're getting back is only because of that problem. So you start to get familiarized with, oh, if I make this silly mistake, this type of error will happen. If I make this silly mistake, this type of message will appear. So that you don't have to look at a message the first time when you're actually programming and try to figure out, oh, but what is it complaining about? Okay. So what I'll do is I'm just going to illustrate two common mistakes in this really simple program. One common mistake is to forget the dollar sign. If you forget a dollar sign, it's, it changes from the immediate operand into a memory operand, into the direct operand. We'll talk about all of that stuff later. But the meaning becomes entirely different. Instead of saying copying the value of 1782 to register EAX, it is now copying the content in memory starting at location 1782 to register EAX. Does everybody understand the difference between those two? The first one is just saying, oh, copy 1782 to another register. Okay, 1782, write it down, I'm done. The other one is basically saying, flip to page 1782 1, in the memory book. Copy the content starting at that location in memory into register EAX. Okay. But we want to see the effect of this. Okay, we want to see, okay, what if I made a mistake like this? What type of problem can happen? This one is a nasty one. It's a nasty one. Okay, by the way, when you use the exclamation point in you know in the in the shell, uh, it means you know repeat the previous command and you can specify um, the starting point or, or the starting characters of the previous command that you want to repeat. So if I want to repeat the assemble command. This is how I do it. This is shorthand, it's, it comes in handy. And then we have to relink the program. And now we can run the program again using GDB. So here's GDB. Uh, I list the program. I put a breakpoint on line four, just like last time. And then I run the program. I'm now ready to execute the instruction on line four. Now observe what happens when I try to single step. It complains, okay? Now this is what you need to know in this class, is when you see a message like this, it's the same thing as a, in Windows it's called something else. It's not called segmentation fault, it's called, um, it's not a blue screen of death. What message do you usually get when a Windows program crashes? It's not responding. Sorry? It's not responding. No, no, it's not stuck in the loop either. Unhandled exception, yep, that's it. It is the same thing, okay, except in Linux it's called a segmentation fault. Um, so when you see something like this, it usually means your program is trying to access a memory location that it is not supposed to, okay? Hmm, but which location is it trying to access 
that is that I'm not supposed to. I mean, this instruction is not even you know supposed to access a memory location. Well, remember the dollar sign that is missing because we did not put in the dollar sign. Seventeen, uh, seventeen eighty two is now specifying the memory location that we are copying from, and that's why it is trying to access a memory location that we are not supposed to, because location seventeen hundred eighty two in memory is protected. Your program is not supposed to have access, read or write, to that location. Are we still doing okay so far with this program? Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and take a look at another program, another uh, mistake that you know people make all the time with programs like this. So we we'll put a dollar sign back to here. Oops, dollar sign. And this time we'll miss a uh, percent symbol. If you miss a percent symbol. EAX becomes just like any other label. It's just a name, okay? It's no longer the name of a register. It becomes the name of something, okay? So let's see what happens when we try to assemble and link the program. We assemble the program. No problem, okay? The assembler is basically saying, oh, it's okay with me. You're just trying to refer to EX1 as a label. I guess somebody else is going to define it. I cannot find the definition within this file, but I'm going to assume somebody else has defined this symbol already. Okay? The linker, on the other hand, is the one utility program that is supposed to resolve all the unresolved symbolic references. And that's going to have a problem, because nobody is defining the label EAX. So the linker comes back and complain and say, uh-uh, I don't know what to do, because nobody told me what EAX is supposed to be. So without the percent symbol, EAX becomes just a regular label, as a regular name. And if nobody is defining that particular name, the linker is going to complain and say, I have no idea what it is. But it is really nice because at least it shows you that the problem is happening on line 4 of EX1.S. So at least you know where the reference is occurring. And you know which line to fix. Are we doing okay so far with you know these two fairly common mistakes that people make in this class? Okay. All right. So switching back to my notes. I keep losing the page that has the content. Is right there. But it doesn't show up shows up here but it doesn't have the uh, the icon of um, Chrome which is weird all right so now we are moving on to the third type of operand the first one is immediate the second one is register and now finally we start to specify what is a memory operand a memory operand is one that refers to the value of a memory location in other words it is um, it needs to retrieve the value from a memory location and your operand is specifying which location in memory that is trying to retrieve those bit patterns from. Okay. <clears throat> of the three main types of, of the three types of operands, this is the, going to be the slowest because it has to go all the way out to memory to retrieve something. On the other hand, a memory operand is really you know, flexible because it can access, with a 32-bit 30, processor, it can access any one of the 2 to the, third, to the power of 32 memory locations, and each location is one byte. So you can, if you have 4 gigs of memory, it can access what, any one of the 4 uh, gigabytes that you have in your memory space. This is also why you know, we have 64-bit operating systems. Can anyone see, just kind of um, infer from this statement why 32-bit operating systems are running out of steam when you have six uh, when you have eight 16 gigs of RAM. You can only access four. Yep, because two to the power of 32 for a 32-bit processor can only specify four about four billion locations, and one location is one byte. So that means you know with a 32-bit processor you can install as much RAM as you want to, but it's not going to help 
because the operating system or the instruction set itself can only address any one of the four billion bytes. If you have memory that is outside of, of the four billion bytes, those are not addressable anymore. So you have all the extra RAM. If you have 16 gigs of RAM and you're running a 32-bit operating system, the other 12 gigs are just wasted. It's just not accessible at all to the operating system. So that's why you use 64-bit operating systems to, uh, so that you can access memory that is beyond the first four gigabytes of memory. Which also you know, goes the other way. If you have a Chromebook or something that has, you know, let's say, two gigs or four gigs of RAM, there's no point in installing a 64-bit operating system on that thing. Okay? In fact, if you install a 64-bit operating system on a machine that does not require a 64-bit operating system, it runs slower. Potentially, it can run slower. Why do you think it can potentially run slower? Well, think about it this way. With 32-bit, if you say, OK, I want you to continue execution at that location, how do you specify that location? Your entire memory space only has 32, uh, only has four uh, billion locations, which only require a 32-bit number, right? So the jump instruction, in the worst case, only require a 32-bit operand to specify where am I going you know, from here? Does that make any sense? But what happens when you have a 64-bit instruction? How do you specify a location, in the worst case, with a 64-bit processor? Go ahead. The address becomes 64-bit, right? So how, what, what happens to the width of the instruction itself? Yep, exactly. It takes more memory, and as a result, it also takes longer because now you need to access mem you need to access more memory content in order to just to get the instruction itself. So that's why you know if you have two or four gigs of memory, there's no point to install a 64-bit operating system. It can potentially make it run slower than a 32-bit operating system. <coughs> Moving on to this part here, memory operands can serve as a source. In other words, you can specify a, an instruction to grab the source or to grab something from memory. Or after computation, you can ask it to store something into memory, but not both at the same time. In other words, you cannot specify a memory operand as both the source and the destination of an instruction. The 386 instruction set offers many different ways to compute the address of the memory location that you're going to access with a memory operand. Um, when I say many, it really means many, like 10. So we'll explore that later in this module. A RISC instruction, a RISC processor typically offer far fewer ways to specify the address of memory location. How many people know what RISC really stands for. I mean, the abbreviation is explained here, but what does it mean? Why do we use RISC processors, and what is an example of a RISC processor? I just want to establish a little bit of context of what it is and why we have that. Can someone you know, give me a, hand me a, a, point to a device that has a RISC processor in it? Very good. Cell phones. Okay, smartphones, they all have RISC processors. Okay, so you know, most, pro uh, risk, most cell phones make use of the ARM architecture these days, and it is a RISC architecture. It has a reduced instruction set, which means instead of having hundreds and hundreds of instructions, it probably has tens, maybe close to 100, of instru 100 instructions. But why? What do you think is the trade off? between a RISC processor versus a CISC, the opposite, which is like an Intel i7 processor, is called a CISC complex instruction set computer. What do you think is the trade-off? Size. Size of the die. Okay, the actual die inside the processor is different. An Intel processor is fairly large. An i7 die is probably visible. Okay, you, you can actually look at the processor and you can actually see the die you know, visibly like about maybe this big or so, okay? What about the size of a RISC processor? Very tiny. 
is a lot smaller, okay? It is much, because the design is simpler, so the hardware is a lot smaller. So what is the trade-off, you know, that you, you get based on the size of the die, or the area of the die? Cost. Cost, okay? That's a, that's a big thing, because out of one wafer, okay, if the die size is large, you can only get a few, you know, processors out of one single wafer. So the wafer is basically the, um, it looks like uh, pizza, it looks like a pizza, except it's made out of silicon, and then you, you put a circuit on it, and then you cut it into smaller you know, chunks, and each chunk becomes a processor, okay? So when you have a large processor, or a processor that has a large die, using the same wafer, so I have two wafers here, one you know, with an i7 processor, and the other one using the ARM processor. So this is kind of exaggerated, you know, they're not really this big. Okay, but let's just say that, you know, this is the size of one i7 processor, okay? And it's just for comparison purposes. On the other hand, we have, you know, the ARM processor. And we'll just make it. Okay, so each square here represents the size of one of the ARM processors. So you can see, on one single wafer, I can only make you know this many i7 processors, but on the same size wafer, I can have a lot more of the ARM processors. Well, big deal, okay? Because you know one i7 processor, I can sell it for 500 bucks, 600 bucks, you know, depending on how n you get. And then the ARM processors are basically commodity items. I mean, they're dirt cheap, okay? No big deal. Well, there's also the problem of yield, okay? What is yield when it comes to manufacturing stuff? Does anyone want to? Yeah, I, don't know. I guess you how, try, how many you tried to make over compared to how many you actually successfully made. Exactly. Okay. So in the manufacturing process, there will be imperfections. Okay. You cannot make you know perfect you know chips, you know, perfect transistors every single time. So what happens is you know the error rate is based on area. Okay, you know, it's the, the number of defects per area count. Okay, so let's just say that you know, with an area this big, we always end up with about 20 defects. Okay, so I'll just put you know, 20 defects you know, onto the wafer here, and then put 20 defects onto this wafer here. Okay, I'm just just imagine these are tw there are 20 here. So now the question is, these 20 defects, how much would it impact? Uh, this wafer that I'm using to make an i7 processors, and how will how will it impact this particular wafer where I'm only using it when I'm using it to manufacture ARM processors? Which one gets a bigger hit? The i7. The i7 takes a much bigger hit, right? Because out of the entire big huge area of that processor, if any defect lands on that die, that processor is not usable. So the percentage impact of this, of this particular design is a lot more than this one. So you, it's not just a matter of you know, how many processors can we fit on the die, it also impacts how, what is the percentage of the usable processor dies out of the entire wafer. But that's only you know, from the manufacturing perspective. From your perspective as an end user, do you want to have an i7 processor on your cell phone? But then you have all the processing power. I mean, you will be able to run all kinds of applications. Yeah. Well, depending on the battery pack, I mean, you can always lug your car battery with you. <laughs> Sealed acid, you know, lead acid battery. Get really hot too with it. Hmm? With the process, get really hot also. Then you just need a bigger fan. <laughs> <laughs> Becomes your personal heater when the when you know the, the outside temperature gets lower, you will have a lot of friends. They'll be sitting around you, and then your processor will be the will be the heating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you guys will be like you're doing this, you know, in the winter. Yep, but that's the reason why you know you do not want to have an i7 or CISC processor in your cell phone. Okay. I'm going to end the lecture soon. I know you guys are ready to go, but I have one more question. What about data centers? In other words, what about you know, those huge you know, establishments uh, for doing massive amount of processing, like Pixar, 
um, Google, you know, all of those, you know, data centers. What t what type of processor do they prefer? This is a trick question. Do you think they want you know more computation power and go for the i7 type of die, or do you think they go for the ARM processor, which apparently has no particular reason to be liked by data centers because they don't really have that much processing power? Because they are more power efficient. Okay, that's the key word. Is you know the measurement or the benchmark uh, is no longer MIPS or you know million instructions per second because you can try you can pack a lot of million instructions per second with these processors the problem is can you extract all the heat from the data center that becomes the that becomes the bottleneck okay the the bottom line is you know with a huge data processing center if they make use of processors of this kind the, they are less efficient when it comes to how much processing power you get per watt Okay. And the watt is always referring to power dissipation as heat. So as a result, if you try to use these type of processors out of you know a facility based on how much heat you can get rid of from inside the building, you can only pack this much you know processing power. On the other hand, with the other processor, even though each one is small and doesn't really do a lot, they are much more power efficient. In other words, give it the same amount of energy, it can get more done. And as a result, data centers are now preferring, or they're, they're switching over to risk processors as a result, okay? Because they are, they can pack more, they can, they can do more processing, you know, per unit of energy, as opposed to the larger processors. There's only one reason why we are still using the Intel architecture. Can someone name that? Uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna close now, but I will, you know, keep, I will you know, keep talking. Okay, I want you guys to.